excited to be here with you to share how we can possibly use this unique historical moment in time as a revolutionary portal for our own next rebirth, regeneration, and a paradigm shift in our own lives. You know, as a therapist, I wait for rock bottom moments. And this moment in time is a rock bottom moment, you know, when you've hit rock bottom. And the reason I wait for these moments, I know I sound so cruel, you won't come to me for therapy after you hear this, is because it's only when we've slammed ourselves against the end of the road, against the wall that doesn't yield, against the rock that cracks your skull, that what it means is that our ego, our defenses, our way of doing things no longer work. And to a normal person, this is a tragedy. To someone like me, this is a welcoming moment. This is a, oh my goodness, thank goodness we're here. Why? Because our modus operandi, our way of traditionally doing things, they need to break down. They should break down. This is what every spiritual teacher waits for. For when our ego, our defense systems, our old way of doing things can no longer work. I know this is a tragedy, but it is also the greatest opportunity, the bejeweled portal for transformation. You see, transformation cannot occur if we stick to the old. You know, everyone comes to therapy wanting to change, but no one really wants to change. I say this all the time. They want their husband to change. They want their nasty toddler to change. They want their irritable teenager to change. No one wants to change, change. No, because we're perfect. We want everyone else to change, but that's why no one truly transforms. Transformation by definition involves a transform, transform. You have to transfer, you have to transform the form, meaning the old has to die. And we humans, we cling to the old. We're like, nope, nope, because we're creatures of complacency, creatures of habit, creatures of pattern. So we cannot stand, we cannot tolerate for the old to die. And this moment in time, for the first time in my history, in my life, global rock bottom has occurred, where we, for the first time, have been given no choice. We humans have been put on a timeout. We've been told, you go to your room and go look at yourself in the mirror. And for the first time, we have had no choice. And this is a spiritually epiphanic moment in history. If we use this moment to understand the lessons, to understand the deep spiritual lessons that can occur here, we have no choice for the first time. And people like me, spiritual teachers, we're like, yay, so good. Because the old was dysfunctional. The old was, was toxic, you know, when I first went on Oprah, only to name drop a little bit, she told me, she said, the zeitgeist is not ready for your message. And I felt like an arrow to my heart. And she said, the world is not ready for you. And when this happened, I wrote to her and I said, this is the zeitgeist now that is going to have to be ready for the new message, for the new voice. Why? Because now we have no choice. The old must come to an end. The old order is being, is being transported back yonder and we are terrified. So for any transformation in any individual life in therapy, I talk about it as in there was the old, the way things were, and we got addicted to the old. And then we go through a tunnel before the new comes about. We are in the tunnel. And the tunnel by nature is dark, it has shadows, it's unknown, it's unfamiliar, and it's unpredictable. We are in the tunnel. And in order for us to now come out to the other side, now we have a choice, right? We can keep clinging to the old or keep walking towards the new. And psychologically, 
this is a paralyzing choice for many to make because we only know the old and the unknown is terrifying. The X factor of life is the most terrifying factor of life. That's why no one changes. No one truly transforms because the unknown is so scary. So we have a psychological choice now to walk toward the new or to cling to the old. And this is where we are as a globe, as a uh, world, as a universe, as a collective. We are in the tunnel. The new hasn't come about, but the old is no longer. So you now in your individual life has to make a choice. Am I bold enough? Am I daring enough to truly look at my life with a re-examined lens through a completely new set of eyes? Am I daring enough to, to look in the mirror and ask myself, all that has not worked needs to go? And am I brave enough to walk toward the unknown future, reimagining a new vision for ourselves? Every transformation in every micro life involves a death. And it's this death that we're terrified of. And we only really die at rock bottom. And that's why I am so excited by this because we are going to die, not necessarily physically, though some may die physically, but certainly spiritually. A spiritual death is a death of the ego. What is the ego? The ego is all things inauthentic, all things external all things we have created as a persona to survive in this crazy world. The ego was created in childhood because somewhere we realized that our true self couldn't be accepted. And so the child, you and I as children adapted, we became good girls or we became overachievers or we became rebels or we became people pleasers or we became comedians or we became really skinny or really fat it doesn't matter. We adopted a persona, many personas, many, many, many faces in order to get love, in order to get validation from our parents. And we've been using one ego face after the other. But typically, the entire world has one persona. It's on one checklist called the ego of success, wealth, accomplishment, achievement, beauty, belonging, to, to name the most typical ones on the checklist. The entire Western world, which is now the entire world, has one ego persona. You and I have been raised, conditioned to check off this checklist. And like robots, we have done it. Now, in the pandemic, for the first time, globally, we have been told to tear the checklist. No checklist anymore. No one is going to get their Botox. No one can go get their hair dye. You know, we're not wearing our bra anymore. Our husbands are like, hello, what happened to my wife? And you're like, F you, I don't care. Because we have now for the first time been asked to end the persona. We can't go to the bar. We can't go to our favorite pubs. We can't go to the theater. We can't go to any of our traditional escapes. All our escapes have been taken away. All our addictions ended. Go Turkey. This is traumatic, you know? I, I, I will have some compassion in a moment. Uh, right now, I know I'm a little ruthless, but I mix between ruthlessness and then compassion. So in the ruthless tone of it, this is so good for us because our ego is being stripped. Our addictions are being stripped and we are being forced to ask for the first time, who am I without? And the only way to answer who am I without is to answer, who am I within? And this is terrifying for most of us. I know at my Valley, not so much, but for the, for the regular people, because they have never ever looked within. And this continuous looking within is exhausting. It's terrifying. So now to enter compassion, we are globally going through a PTSD. This is terrifying. Big feelings are coming up. And we don't know how to manage these big, big feelings without our band-aids. We're like, where are all my band-aids? I have none of my band-aids. Now I'm forced to look at the wound without any of my normal addictions to cover it up. The wounds are staring at us 
without any cover up. And it is painful now to look at ourselves without any masks, right? To use the analogy of the mask, the masks have been stripped. And we need to have compassion for what's coming up because big feelings are showing up. And with our children, they're acting crazy. If you have teenagers, you know what I mean, because they're going through a cold turkey because we've raised them to be conditioned to want constant, instant gratification. And their syringes of dopamine are being taken away. So now they have to fend for themselves and they're irritable. Now we have to look at our partners and look at our relationships and, and see it for what it is. You know, maybe till now your partners came back only at nine o'clock at night. Now they're here all day long. And you're like, wow, I didn't know that you were so lazy or I didn't know that, wow, you don't really, really like to do much or you're constantly upset or you eat a lot. Wow, you in the fridge again? <laughs> and you begin to notice things about each other that you never saw till now. So Esther writes, so true, having a teenager at home is a nightmare. Well, it's not so much that it's a nightmare, it's the real life that is being exposed. So we're being exposed to this and it is shocking and it is terrifying and big feelings are coming up and our number one uh, plague was that we couldn't tolerate big feelings as a culture. Our culture is raised to not tolerate big feelings. And now we're not only being asked to tolerate it, we're being asked to tolerate it with these other people who cannot tolerate it. And you're like, I don't like you. I don't even like you. And you're my family and I'm stuck with you. It's solitary confinement 24 seven. So lots of stuff is coming up. And now we're being asked to understand how to tolerate big feelings, how to tolerate PTSD. And let me tell you something about PTSD. You know, many of us are going to blame our teenagers and blame our partners and blame the pandemic. But what I want you to understand is that what is showing up right now is what always was. It was just hidden under the surface. So I'm sorry to tell you, if your relationship is falling apart or if it, you're seeing the dysfunction in your own life or you're realizing you're an eating addict or uh, an alcoholic, don't blame the pandemic. Understand that this is really what was always underneath. It was just covered up with your Prada shoes and your jacket going to work and your schedule and your organization. But once that was taken away, this is underneath. And instead of having self-loathing or your teenage loathing or your husband loathing, use this as a mirror to go within, to ask, okay, I'm at rock bottom. This is some severe PTSD. I want to blame everyone on the outside, but this is a co-participation, me with my life. This is not happening to me. I am a co-creator. Now, how do I look in this mirror as an opportunity to truly heal myself? This is the wisdom of no escape. Pema Chodron wrote a book called The Wisdom of No Escape. This pandemic is about the wisdom of no escape. For the first time in our lives, we have all on a global level asked to go within, to go into a still place, a solitary place, to truly go home and to ask what is essential? What is truly essential? The virus is not about COVID-19, the true virus is the human mind, the ignorance of the human mind. We are not here per chance. We are not here because of some, something happening in some Chinese market. We are here because of a true interdependence of cause and effect of which you and I are part of. A small part, mostly irrelevant, but in the big scheme of things, very integral because our mind is the collective mind and the collective mind is our mind. So the disease is not the COVID-19. The disease is our human ignorance. This is the true virus. The reason why America is exploding the way it is, is because the true underlying disease of interracial warfare has come up because once you open the wound and you, have, you sit with one wound, and for the first time, and I'm just talking about America for a second, but it's, it's symbolic and I'm not talking about race in, in, because I want to go into race, but I'm talking about the symbolism of how when we sit with one wound, other wounds show up. 
So that's why I'm, I'm warning people that if they're experiencing this in their lives as, as a cataclysmic of a domino effect, it's because for the first time you're sitting with one wound. So in America, as a symbol of this, for the first time, white people, rich white people, political gov governing white people had to sit at home and sit still. For the first time, the privileged were not allowed to go and use their privilege. The virus said, mm, I am democratic. I don't care whether you're rich, whether you're skinny, whether you're really pretty and you really need to get your injections. I don't care. You sit at home too. And you sit at home too. And you sit at home too. And for the first time, because everyone was forced to sit in stillness, now the pus from underneath comes out, you see? This is not per chance. This virus is the greatest, I mean, I cannot tell you what a teacher of the Tao it is, what a teacher of Zen it is. It is what every spiritual teacher cranks their veins in their neck trying to preach. It is teaching the most profound spiritual lessons. I can't even believe it. Like if you had to ask every spiritual teacher, what do you wish for the world? The spiritual teacher would say, well, I would wish, but it will never come true that everybody goes inside themselves and goes on a global timeout and shuts the F up and sits still and goes within and learns to connect to who it is they are. But it'll never happen because we are just addicted to the external world and we are so greedy and consuming. How will it ever happen? And there now it has. And once you allow the sitting, we have to sit. And in Zen they say, and sit some more, and sit some more, and sit some more. This is grossly uncomfortable. You know, I teach meditation uh, daily on, uh, on the internet and people cannot sit, right? They're like looking at their watch all the time. When I went for my first meditation retreat, I swear to you, I would look every 30 seconds. I couldn't believe only 30 seconds had passed since the last time I looked. I wanted to take the watch and choke myself. I wanted to take somebody's keys and go drive off. But I, I, had, uh, I had shared a ride, so I couldn't bother that person. It is torture. But this is the essential ingredient for transformation. We must connect to who it is we are and disconnect from all that has been inauthentic. So we are in the tunnel. I call the tunnel no woman's land or no man's land. We are in no man's land with the unique opportunity now to combust all old paradigms and step into the new. The, the daring question is whether we will be able to reconstruct our lives on a new paradigm, on a new vision, toward a new uh, paradigm shift of a new world, of a new order. So I am going to take some questions and then we will go to part two. Ooh, Dr. Shafali, you're dropping truth bombs of epic proportion. I'm watching the chat as well, and I think I'm not the only one here who will, I will quote Will Kana saying, preach. This is incredible. And we do have some questions that are in the pipeline. For those of you who haven't clicked on the Q&A function yet, I'd encourage you to click on it and go upvote some of the questions that are already there or ask your own question. And I'm seeing a lot of them. I'll, I'll go through the, one of the first ones. A lot of them are related to uh, dealing with children during these times. And so let's start with Christy Barlett. Christy asks, do you have any tips for consciously parenting where you support and encourage a child or children to flourish while maintaining boundaries that allow you to stay sane, to sleep, and to do things that you need to do other than focusing 100% of your attention on them? And I'm talking about toddlers here. Well, so I'll try to make it general for every age group. So the question is, how do you connect to your child and how do you have boundaries, right? This is mm -hmm. the, the biggest question. How do you eat one cookie and not all 12, you know? How do you feed your hunger, but then don't go overboard? So I, in my book, The Conscious Parent, I talk about the two wings of the ego. And one of them is connection and the other one is containment, which is aka boundaries. This is the epitome of the parenting struggle. So if you're looking for an answer, the answer will be found in the awareness that this is the struggle. You need both wings to fly of connection and containment, and your life will be a constant dance between both. Now, parents, they want the strategy. Well, you want a strategy because you think your kid on some subconscious level should be a puppet to the master's wishes. Unfortunately, our children are wild, raging, feral creatures who were, who were born from wolves. 
but you want to tame them and you want them to be your minion, your soldier. We all do. I want, I, I, that's the reason we have children, is finally for somebody to be under your control so that you could feel a sense of control. But the reality is, and this is what COVID is teaching you, that there is no control. So the big truth bomb, big spiritual lesson, one of them that COVID is teaching us is that there is no control in life. So this control that we've been seeking is an illusion, right? The certainty that we've been seeking is an illusion. This virus is teaching us more than ever the real lesson that, wow, I have no control. Now with children, the main thing we desire is control. Right? Whether you want to accept it or not, you want to have control. From 7.42 to 7.47, we will have our soup. From 7.47 to 7.49, we will say thank you to God. From 7.49, you'll shut your eyes, and by 8 o'clock, we will all be asleep. Well, life doesn't work like this, does it? And then who gets frustrated? You, because you create these unrealistic expectations, because you imagine you have this ubiquitous control because you're playing God in your own way. You know, you know you are. You know that you think you're some majestic king, queen, or God, you know, some version of God herself or himself. And you think your children are here to follow you. Well, guess what? No. So then you have child number two. You're like, maybe child number one was defective, got the, the husband's genes. I'll have child number two. Child number two doesn't work out. You have child number three. And then you finally, I hope, figure it out, okay? But then the, now the world is combusting with overpopulation from parents like us who want to have control. So there is no control. COVID is teaching us there is no control. Life is an eternal balance between wanting connection and wanting boundaries. So I know I'm not giving you the answer you seek because the answer is not, because I'm not in your house. I can't tell you, oh, say this to your kid now. And then you, you say this to your kid right now. You, your kid doesn't like string beans. The other kid doesn't like to go poop. I can't be in your home. I can teach you to understand that life is the balance between connecting. So you understand your kids' feelings. You go beneath the words and the behavior. You can read my books. I talk about it. Connect to the need. And then you have to put a container. You know, we will read two stories at night, which really means 25 stories. And then we will go to sleep. So you as a parent, once you understand that life is constantly going to be a battle, between connection and control. And you're constantly watching your ego, your desire to play God, your desire to, to rule your roost. You're watching your ego take my quest. Then you will check your ego and check your reactivity and then come back to center. I've never, like every time you speak, Dr. Shafali, it's like a combination of the deepest wisdom and the most amount of laughter I get to have in the same moments, which is extraordinary. And so we have some similar questions that are coming up to the top, which I feel like your answer you just said is very similar. So I'll, I'll pick one here that's very specific. And I think pro, uh, parents might be uh, seeing this happen more especially in the COVID times, which is uh, coming from Lauren Watts here is, how can we aid our children in avoiding the mistakes of becoming detached through technology and video games since they are unable to connect with their peers? Yes. On one hand, you know you're so grateful for technology because we can do this and our children can leave us alone. You know, if you did not have technology, I mean, your children would be... A, around you 24 seven. So on one hand, praise technology, yes? On the other hand, it is a plague, it is a disease, it is going to rot your children's brain, go inside it, abduct it, and transport it to another reality. Your children will come out of the room, aliens, zombies, and monsters. Yes, now what to do? This is the hell and heaven of life. Yes, you want it, but you want your kids to have control. You want your kids to only go on the video games for one hour a day. And then they don't. Suddenly the video game has eaten your child and changed them and mutated them into this absolute mad person. So what to do? Well, this is it. What to do? Do you want to have technology to give you a break? Well, it's also going to drive you crazy. It's, you know, people want a neat packaged answer. So going to COVID, COVID is teaching us that connection to the self is what's missing. Our teenagers are addicted to technology because we are addicted to technology. On one hand, it has its power and its blessing. On the other hand, very close to the power is its powerlessness. And it's going to evoke both. And COVID is teaching us now, well, negotiate that. Negotiate that in your home. You have to now figure out a new reality. It's asking us to adapt. And it doesn't mean you have to take it all away. It doesn't mean you have to give it all in. But dancing that line between the power and powerlessness that we're feeling right now is the answer. COVID is 
stripping the rug from under our feet, where hours and hours spent with these people we call family is leaving us feeling lost and <laughs> as if claustrophobic. And on the other hand, it's offering us a vital opportunity for connection. So where before you were connecting on the drive to the baseball field in the doing, now COVID is forcing you to learn how to be. And your kids don't know how to be because your kids were raised on technology. But to be honest, even though we were not raised on technology, we have also forgotten how to be. So how to be now without the doing? This is the, the detox that is being asked for. We are being asked to detox from all the doing, but now you're sitting looking at each other and going, I don't know how to be, right? Now, how many hours? My goodness, it's been six hours with you. I mean, I, I like you, but I don't know whether I like you that much. So now you're being forced to negotiate how to be. I mean, how many walks can you go on? How many games can you play? I mean, we've been there, done that. We're like, okay, I've connected now enough. Can you go to summer camp already, right? I, I am appalled that my kid may not go to college. I mean, I just have to be honest. I mean, I'm looking at a bleak future. I was like, she's 17. I could see the end in horizon. I would cry at the dormitory. I was like ready to do my crying. But now I'm like, please, can I cry at the dormitory? Can I please cry and send you off? It may not happen. We will be stuck with our children forever. And we have to deal with it. You wanted the children, now you're stuck with them. Childhood is now going to extend to 30. Just saying. That's incredible. And with that, I wanted to give you the chance to do your part two, and we'll get back to Q&A towards the end of your session. Okay. So now going back to what is this present moment here to teach us? Let's look in the mirror and ask, what are our lessons here? What, what are we here to learn? And the lessons are specific, so I'm going to run through them so that you can, you can take notes or keep them in mind. Um, the first lesson is that the most vital skill that we are missing, which I just referred to, is the skill, is the skill of interconnection. In order to be interconnected, however, we have to be intraconnected, to go within. The virus is teaching us so profoundly, right, what the Buddha taught. The Buddha taught, through the breath, you will discover presence. Through presence, you will awaken. Through the present moment of connecting to your breath, breath after breath after breath. The Buddha did not teach chanting meditation. The Buddha did not teach tree meditation or fairy meditation, or let's think of an island and float in the ocean meditation. The Buddha taught breath meditation. Why? Because the breath is in the moment. And as long as you connect to your breath, which is yours, you will discover the secret to living a presence-filled life. The breath is your connection between the external world and the internal world, right? What is the one thing that you take in from the external world on a daily basis to fulfill and sustain your internal world? The breath. The breath is such an eloquent instrument of all symbolism of awakening, if you understand it. The breath never leaves you. You don't have to take your chant, your book, your teacher. You're like, oh, I don't have my yoga mat. Oh, it's okay. You have your breath. The breath is constant and through its constancy teaches us that life is constantly impermanent because every breath is a different breath. The breath never lasts. The breath is one breath. Now you're on to the next breath. It teaches you how to live in the moment. When you learn to live in this very connected way, moment after moment after moment, you realize that life's impermanence is the holy grail. And all that we were seeking pre-pandemic was permanence, was the illusion of the future. You and I know pre-pandemic, we were constantly in the future. The greatest spiritual wisdom of the Buddha and Eastern mysticism is that there is no time except for the present. My tomes of writing always talk about how children and parents clash for one main reason, especially young children, because children live in the present and parents live in the past, but mostly the future. We have been engineering our children's lives to go to the future. And the entire childhood has become a microcosm of adulthood. It is striving, it is clinging, it is craving, it is checklist, it is achieving, it is doing, it is comparison, comparison, it is consumerism, it is greed, it is acquisition. We have mutated childhood, which was supposed to be a time 
from age one to at least 12, to 12. Now barely our children have a window till two that they can maybe smell the roses. By two, they're cross-country skiing, they're learning the trombone, and certainly three languages, and trying to do the spelling bee, right? Because we parents are insane, 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 insane. So this is a moment of our reckoning. COVID is showing us our insanity, because COVID is, show, is telling us, oh, you wanted a future, huh? Dr. Shivali, you were so excited your daughter's 17 because 18 was right around the corner and you were waiting, waiting, waiting. You were secretly checking up, already buying her duvet, already doing up her college room. You were so excited. You were like booking your ticket. When you drop her, you're going to Hawaii. Aha, uh -huh. you were in the future, weren't you, Dr. Shivali? No, you're not. You're here. Be here now. I don't know. I don't want to be. I don't like this. This is not how it should have been. And then COVID says to me, oh, so you were in the should, weren't you? You were shooting yourself. I was like, I was shooting. I'm so sorry. I was shooting. Forgive me. Can you please go away? I promise I won't shoot anymore. And COVID goes, aha, I know you, you liar. You will should right as soon as I go away, you're going to start shooting again. Well, now COVID is telling us no future. So the Buddha teaches no future, no future. So my, my mantra for the last decade, I know you, I, I'm failing miserably, but it, it, in, the, in my big self is that there is no future, no future. If you understand this, you have learned the secret of life. There has never been a future. There will never be a future because there is no future. Future <laughs> is a delusion. It's ignorance. There is no such thing as supremacy. There's no such thing as hierarchy in terms of power and ego. There is no such thing as past. There's no such thing as future. There's no such thing as good. There's no such thing as bad. COVID is stripping away all judgment, all desire, all dreams, all fantasies of the, of the goblin coming into our yard and giving us some message about the universe. No, only now. The brutal, unabashed, untainted, unproduced, nothing glamorous about the now. And it's asking us, can you live in your now without any escape? No escape, no future. Because there's only and has only ever been the present. All our ideas about the future were our delusion. And not only that we had ideas, oh, we had attachment. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be at the, at the Mind Valley University in Amsterdam. I'm going to smoke pot in the bar. I'm going to have uh, brownies with marijuana. Mm, none, none of it is going to happen. None of it. Right? Gone. It's, it was supposed to be now. Where is it? Ah, because it was all a fantasy. Now, it doesn't mean you don't plan for the future. You plan for the future, but you plan it with a playfulness, with Lila. The word for playfulness in Sanskrit is Lila with a joy, with an understanding, it's all an illusion. You've heard me say this before, I named my daughter Maya because the name means illusion. So I would remind myself, anytime I thought she was mine, I'm in illusion. All of this is an illusion and COVID is showing us it's, it's chimerical, it's a whimsical dream, it's a mirage. The fact that we're here, virtual and not in bloody Amsterdam, cycling by the canal, shows that all our plans for that future in our past was an illusion. So we can plan, but we have to do it with playfulness, with joy, with laughter, like, ha, oh, I'm planning. Oh, let me plan. I'm just going to enter my little bubble of planning and let me plan, okay? But laughing at ourselves that we are fools because attaching to the plan is completely ignorant. So COVID is showing us no future. Pin this as a streamer, all ticker tape all around your house, in your brain, no future. And the next time, you are planning for your kid's future and your future and future, future, future. Cut it. Slap yourself like a Zen monk slaps his, tu his uh, pupil and, and says, hey, where, where did you go? And the pupil goes, I went to the future. Come back to the present. Now, the only moment is now. So parenting has all been a waste of our energy driving our children to the future, to live in the future, telling them that life is suffering. And the kid is like, why did you bring me here then and have two siblings after me to torture me more? And you're like, well, if you follow the checklist, then life won't be suffering. So mom and dad, are you suffering right now? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We want you to be happy, 
right? And the kid looks around and goes, I don't see anyone happy. I see alcoholics, bulimics, overeating, people who are zombies. Where is the happiness? And you're like, it'll come, it'll come. Just follow the checklist. Right now, mom and dad are only at point 42 on the checklist. We have to go to 65. Happiness is on 66 to 72, right? Then we die. So this is how we've been living. It's been a madness. And now we are going cold turkey, stop. We're realizing that the breath is the most vital thing. The COVID spreads through the breath. It shows us, wow, the breath. I've been missing my breath. But through the breath, once I focus on my breath, I come into the present, to the present moment. And when I come into the present, I realize that life is impermanent and we are interconnected. So no more delusions of supremacy because it's democratic. My breath and your breath. You could give me COVID, whether you're rich, poor, black or white. And I could do the same to you. Now COVID is showing us, wow, we're really interconnected, a breath away from dying. Next, COVID teaches us that death is imminent. Death is constant. Death is always happening. But in our illusion, we thought that we were static, that we were, we were you know, off an identity. Yes, we have an identity. But our identity, at the end of the day, is only our breath. Because a breath away from death we are. And COVID has shown this so symbolically, that we are a breath away from death. And this is a, a, a spiritual teaching that should hit us at our core because the next time we're shaming our children and the next time we're telling them to be skinny or to be faster or to be better or to get that A grade in a subject that doesn't match their temperament or their brain, we can stop, we can pause and we can go, hey, 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 do I really care about this really right now? Right? Where are the grades? Where's college? Where are our Gucci bags? We're not going to the opera anymore. So all those things to show off to the other. I mean, I haven't worn a proper pair of pants. I've been in yoga pants the entire three months, right? Nothing is being worn. I'm wearing five t-shirts and two pairs of pants. That's it, recycling. But it's teaching us to pare down, to, to detach from these external addictions and to teach our children that what matters the most is their interconnection and their intra connection and teaching them that simplicity, minimalism is the way. It's always been the way. What is essential? What is essential? And what is essential is connection. That's it, of course, with boundaries. But when I say connection, what I mean is it trumps achievement, the being before the doing. First, connect to yourself. First, are you in sync with your authentic self? Are you being you? Or are you being driven like sheep to the slaughterhouse? Who are you truly? And this is a moment to discover that. And let me tell you, our children will do far better than we will in this time of crisis because children by nature live in the present. Children by nature are in the unadorned, unembellished, natural war state of existence. Children are the closest to nature already. It's we who have taken childhood and produced it and contorted it and medicated it and prescribed it and created a vision for it when its only aim was to be in connection to itself. Life's only purpose is to discover itself in its natural state. And COVID is now offering us an opportunity to discover who it is we are, connect to our raw, unproduced, unembellished state, unadorned state of existence, and look at ourselves in the mirror without the hair dye, without the curlers, without the makeup and go, do I like myself? Do I truly feel at home with who it is I am? And am I offering this to my children where they can stop the doing for a moment, a brief respite? When else in life have we, we been given this expanse of time to rest in, to, to lean into? We have had a dysfunctional relationship with time. We have been at odds with time, at a war with time, a race against time. This is not the way to live. <laughs> it's not a way to live racing to adulthood and then racing to achievement and then racing to happiness, looking for things on the outside. This is what we have addicted our children to. And no one is happy because as long as we are racing at war, and not able to sit still and lean into the present moment, we will be constantly in despair. Our relationship with time is now being asked 
to be redefined. You've never perhaps thought about this. And your relationship to self, your relationship to other, and your relationship to nature. No longer can we ever have the arrogance to think that we are of animal. We are, came from animal. No. Now for the first time, the virus has shown us that we are no more than any other animal or being out there. We are in fact at the mercy of, an, of a, a formless virus, something we cannot even see. And it's teaching us that the enemy is not on the outside. It's only on the inside. We are animal. We are nature. We are earth. We are soil. We are no more than bacteria and virus and poop and, and soil and fungus and mold and pus and guts and blood and, and blood vessels. This is who we are covered in Prada and Gucci and lipstick and Chanel. This is our nature is nature. And we are being asked to go back to nature to strip all the bullshit and come back to the essentials of life. But this is going to feel like a, a cold turkey withdrawal. You're going to be in rehab and feeling the shivers and the pangs of this, this de-addiction, this, uh, this detoxification. It's not pretty. And that's why everyone is clinging back to let's go back to how things work. Instead of staying here, it's only been three months and people cannot tolerate it. Three months of being asked to reconfigure and we are already wanting to race back to what? To the madness that it was? To wanting to, the biggest achievement is to lose 10 pounds? The, the biggest goal is to have more money? No, now this virus is asking us to see our interconnection to see the racial inequities we've been living with, to see the gross in inequalities of our lives and to go, wow, we need to change on a micro to change on the macro. And the way to change is first in the individual. First, you have to detoxify, de-addict yourself from all the externals. You have to reframe your existence. You have to first strip away from your own masks and become authentic, which means it'll take another few months right? No journey. Every time a client comes to me and they ask me, well, how, how should I change? And I go, don't, don't say how, because that's just resistance. If you truly want to change, you'll stop asking how, and you'll just lean into the surrender of the present moment. And the journey will take a minimum of a year or two years. And they go, oh my goodness, I don't have that much time. And then I say to them, but time for what? You, this is the, to heal. Healing takes time. Repurposing yourself takes space. And if we don't dedicate ourselves, and the COVID is forcing us to, I mean, what an opportunity to go within and repurpose ourselves so that we can come out of this renewed, replenished, different, with different parameters for what happiness is and for what success is. And this is what we owe our children. It's time to pass a new baton. The old order is coming to an end and a new is beginning. Our children are the first ones on the, on the lines to receive a new order. It's our generation that is the toxic generation. It's us who needs to break the pattern. It's us who stand between the old and the new. It starts with you and I. Are we ready to let go of the old baton and pass on the new? This is the challenge that this opportune moment in history is offering you, but it begins with you individually in the stillness of your own presence.